Hey, Jen, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Maria. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm excited to be chatting with you. We were talking before that I got your email like, may I be on your podcast? Here's all the things that I'm going to send you. And I'm like, nope, you had me at, can I be on your podcast? You're oh, excited. bless <laughs> you. I <laughs> swear. So, <great. laughs> so, so we are going to be talking about some cool, wonderful, beautiful services that you have as someone who has experienced the fertility journey as you have. And so I can't wait. Let's jump in. Are you okay with that? Let's jump in. Sure. Okay. First, tell us your whole name and who you are and what you do and all that. <laughs> so my name's Jen. I'm a Pilates and yoga and meditation teacher. I've been teaching uh, for about 15 years now, and I have a, a long fertility journey of my own. But it wasn't until my second fertility journey where I was trying to have my second baby that I really fell in love with yoga. And I found a form of yoga called fertility yoga, which I had never really heard about before. And, and as you well know, when you're in the, the midst of a fertility journey, you're kind of like, I'll do anything, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of my thinking at the time. Um, and this sounds a little bit cliched, but gosh, it changed my life in many ways. And I was very, very lucky to, after many years of fertility treatments and IVF and miscarriage, I fell pregnant naturally. And I attribute a lot of that to practicing yoga and incorporating it into my life. So now it's what I do. That's what I, I help women discover this practice for themselves. And I show them how it can help their fertility journeys and their life. And I love it. So that brings me here today. That is so perfect. I didn't realize that you had practiced for 15 years, right? But then you like really fell in love with the yeah. yoga. Because I was the same when I didn't guess, okay, yoga is exercise, you move your body. But during the fertility process, there's so much more depth <laughs> to yoga. Can, can I hear your experience with that? What made you fall in love with it? Sure. So I actually started teaching Pilates mostly in, oh. in 2009. So that was my main focus initially. And I did that for many, many years. And I actually specialized in pre and postnatal care because the clinic that I worked at in Sydney, that was their specialty. So I kind of fell into it and I absolutely loved it. It was just such a, such an amazing experience being able to support women at such a really crucial and special time of their life. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I then wanted to have a family of my own that I realized it just as we all know, it wasn't so easy for me and many of us. And I had my first baby after two rounds of IVF. We we're very lucky. That was our one little embryo after two rounds of IVF. And I thought that that was the hardest part of my journey. When I came to have, wanting to have a second child, I thought, you know, my body's been pregnant I know how to do this. Surely it's going to be easier this time, as I'm sure many of us think, but it wasn't. And it was it was a much, much more difficult journey for many, many reasons. Um, and the last round of IVF that we went through that obviously wasn't successful was at the beginning of 2020. And just after I found out my last transfer didn't work, we went into lockdown. And of course, all the fertility, fertility clinics were closed and we had no idea you know, when we will be able to do another cycle or pursue any kind of additional treatments. And I was stuck at home. I couldn't go to work because my studio was closed and I had nothing to, to kind of support me on my fertility journey. And I thought I am never, never going to complete my family. You know, I'm so lucky to have my daughter, but, you know, women say, they know when their family is complete. And I just always felt mine wasn't quite there. So like I said, a friend of mine recommended this, uh, this whole yoga thing. And I thought, look, I'm in lockdown. I'm literally at home all day. I might as well give it a go. And I started noticing little things when I first started practicing. For example, I started to sleep better. I'd had horrible insomnia throughout my fertility journey. And it went away, just completely went away. I found I stopped bursting into tears all day long at everything. <laughs> um, and then bigger things started to happen. So I had 
a thyroid condition which started to rebalance and I eventually decreased my medication and stopped taking it altogether. And then I fell pregnant naturally and that threw me completely. I have to point out that I lost that pregnancy um, at eight weeks, sadly. Gosh, even all these years later, it still brings up all the feels. But that wasn't the lowest point of my journey. As horrible as losing a baby is, as, as so many women know, it, it just, it still gave me a sense of possibility. I had done something that no doctor said was possible. You need IVF, you know, you have a 5% chance, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I did it. So I thought there's something here. There's something that I need to learn more about. So I went and I retrained as a yoga teacher and I specialized in um, hormonal balance yoga and pre and postnatal, which is all very closely linked. And then I found an amazing training school specializing in fertility yoga. So I dove into all of their training and started incorporating it into my practice. And a few months later, I fell pregnant again, naturally. And that little boy is nearly a year and a half old. And yeah, so that's that was my experience with it. And I just, you know, I love Pilates. I think it's an incredible resource for especially women who are pregnant and recovering from birth. But when it comes to fertility, Pilates and a lot of exercise really has nothing to offer you. Sure, it might be a, a, like a stress release or something you do to feel good, but it, it can't really work with your cycle. It doesn't really you know, accommodate for how you're feeling emotionally and mentally. But yoga somehow does, and it takes you out of that constant feeling of vigilance. And when you're in that fight or flight response constantly, it is so hard to focus on anything else. And yoga really brought me back to myself. And I felt like me for the first time in many years. So that's my very long winded answer to how my experience with yoga initially came about. And yeah, like I said, now I'm lucky enough to teach women all around the world how this practice can help them. Yeah. So many questions, Jen. I have so many questions. Um, I, I would love to get like, a, a start with a grounded question. I am curious how, I had no idea that there was such training as yoga specifically for like hormonal balance. So how does that, how does that, can you give us an example of what that looks like? Are there just specific poses or specific breath work? What, what, what does that entail? I'm just so curious. Sure. So obviously it depends on what the hormonal imbalance is. And I'm speaking purely from a female perspective. Um, okay. that, that, that is where my training is. So normally when we're talking about women and hormonal imbalances, it comes down to the menstrual cycle. So whether or not you have a regular cycle, whether or not you have really painful periods, perhaps you have another hormonal imbalance like a thyroid condition or you have adrenal fatigue, all of these things can be looked at from a yogic perspective. So, for example, the first thing we do is look at the menstrual cycle and we say, okay, there are four phases. There's menstruation, there's the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. And the practices that we do in each of these four phases is really different. So during menstruation, super gentle, restorative, we just allow the body to release and let go. And then throughout the follicular and ovulatory stages, we're building up energy and increasing blood flow and heat in the body. After ovulation, we start to then taper off and then bring the practices back to more of that restorative or more of those yin practices where your nervous system can start to regulate. And you can take these yogic practices and incorporate them to any other exercise that you're doing. So, you know, during your period, you rest and, you know, as you work up towards ovulation, you increase intensity. But the added benefit of yoga is the particular poses that we do, depending on what the hormonal imbalance is, we can nourish and stimulate the different um, the glands throughout the body. So for example, if it's the thyroid gland, we do movements and exercises to gently compress and then release the throat and the neck to, first of all, like bring energy and then release, uh, create blood flow, mobilize the areas. 
Uh, when we're talking about the adrenals, we want to do poses that support and kind of massage and release those as well. And the other thing that yoga is very big on, which I'm sure you've seen anyone who's been to a yoga class has seen is we do a lot of inversions, which is where your heart is higher than your, sorry, <laughs> your heart is lower than your hips. So for example, in a downward dog, yeah. So, or a handstand, for example, where, you know, your hips are above your heart. And what that does is it reverses the normal blood flow. So it's not something we would hold for a really long time. Sort of 10 minutes would be the absolute max in a gentle inversion. But that inversion allows the blood to flow up to the brain and the pituitary gland. And that nourishes and sends fresh blood to those areas as well. And then when you come out of that inversion, um, all of the, the lymph that is running through your body and all of the blood that has been sent to your brain can then disperse throughout the body. And it's really healing and restorative. So yeah, it's a pretty amazing practice. And when I first learned about it, I thought it all sounded a bit woo, but there is a lot of science behind it, which really works well with my very kind of left-brained type A personality where I like everything kind of structured and I want to know why and this, this works because of this reason. And I find that yoga blends that beautiful balance of science and sort of spirit really well. Yes. Oh, thanks for that explanation. I, that makes total sense now that you spelled it out for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know much about, you know, obviously training in yoga, but that makes total sense. Okay. So I have a question for you as a teacher. One of the most embarrassing things for me when I went to yoga class was <laughs> to tell an instructor where I was in a cycle particularly when I was menstruating, how do you handle that? <laughs> how do you handle that in your classes? So I have to say that I'm probably one of the best teachers to tell that to, because that's, that's my training. And that's, I, I ask my clients when they come to me, when I'm doing private lessons, my first question is where are you at in your cycle? Cause it will determine the whole session. Yes. So the, so I, I, I love that question and I will you know accommodate that person if you have if you do have your period and you come to one of my classes I don't say to them go home but I say to them take it easy you know uh, let's do the restorative work let's do some gentle mobility stuff but when it comes to the more energetic poses and the inversions which we avoid during our period I say look just rest in child's pose or you know take a bit of a breather have a sip of water whatever you need to do but I do get a lot of people saying to me after they've done my classes or they've they've done some of my online sessions, they, they'll go to a class at their gym or their local studio and they'll tell their teacher, oh, just so you know, um, you know, I just had an embryo transfer or I know I'm currently prepping for my IVF cycle web or, you know, uh, you know, I'm in my two week wait and 10 times out of 10, the instructor is blank and doesn't participate. <laughs> so. Look, it's something that I really encourage women to be educated about because it's really easy to change your exercise routine around your cycle, no matter what exercise you, you enjoy doing. Uh, so look, if you're coming to my class, no problem. Easy for me to modify. But if you are going to studios where the instructor really doesn't know how to to handle that kind of question, then I encourage you to learn more about what works for you at different stages of your cycle. Oh, thank you for that. Which this leads me into my next question or next really a conversation around it, because when I dealt with my own fertility issues, um, yoga was, and of course I'm more focused on emotional mental health, right? But yoga for me was permission to listen to my own body. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing more um, apparent then when I went into a studio and compared myself to what everybody else could do, but then gave myself permission to just do what my body could do and to listen to it, that particular pose didn't feel good. This particular pose felt much better. And so it sounds to me like you're quite encouraging around folks feeling into what they feel like that day. Definitely. So when we think about yoga, especially from a Western perspective, what do we think? 
what comes to mind normally is people say is they think about acrobatic poses on Instagram or going to fancy studios or wearing expensive active wear. And look, there's nothing wrong with any of that. If it encourages you to embrace yoga and that's what gets you in, great. But that was never the intention of yoga. It was developed thousands of years ago in India. Like there were, there was no Instagram. So it was never meant to be about what fancy things you can do with your body. The purpose and the goal of yoga was always to bring you back to the highest version of yourself. And that's simply the point of yoga. And we do that in many different ways. But what you see on the mat is only one part of it. There are actually eight limbs of yoga and the asana or the physical practices that you see people doing is only one part. And it is a big part and it's an important part. And if it gets people into yoga because people want to exercise and they want to move and they feel good, then that's great. I've, I sort of see it as a bit of a gateway drug to yoga. You know, I get you in with the, the exercise, but I teach you what you really, really need. Um, but yoga really was intended for every body. And it makes me so sad when people say, oh, I really want to start yoga, but I just, I need to get a bit fitter first, or I need to get it, you know, before I get into a class. And that makes me so sad because it is so adaptable. I mean, I've done sessions for people in wheelchairs, people with prosthetic limbs. You know, you don't have to be a gymnast in order to, to practice yoga. So coming back to what you were saying, Maria, it is all about bringing you into what feels good for your body and how that affects the rest of your life. So when we're thinking about a, a fertility journey and you're in the midst of, you know, treatments and doctor's appointments, I feel like your body is no longer yours. You know, you're, you've got these internal scans and injections and blood tests every day. And all of that power is taken away from you. You don't get to choose, you know. But when you come to your mat or, gosh, even sitting on the floor and closing your eyes and just listening to how you feel, feeling the weight of your body down on the floor or the mat, that is what yoga is about. It really is about bringing you back to what's most important, and that's you. So I encourage anyone who isn't sure about what kind of way to start or, you know, thinking they have to be at a certain fitness level or trying to compare themselves to others to kind of put that aside and hopefully do what you did, Maria, and listen to what your body was telling you that it wanted because that's where it can really help you. Yeah, thank you for that. Because when I was sweating like crazy in a hot yoga class... <laughs> Does my body need this right now? Maybe it did. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> oh no, my body was like, get the fuck out of here. Right? <laughs> get out. <laughs> well, there you go. So I Tick did. You. <laughs> <laughs> but it still felt embarrassing. Like I had to, I have to leave. But I felt like, oh, I screwed up or I'm less than or something, right? So it was a it was a process. And I learned that my my body just is not good for hot yoga. It's just not. No, um, look, I can speak to a, a million reasons why hot yoga isn't really good for everyone, especially mm -hmm. women who are trying to conceive. Yeah. But thank you. It, it isn't it's it's a very specific practice, and I get why people like it and get into it. But uh yeah, there there are many other ways to move your body. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure we could have a whole podcast episode on hot yoga and <laughs> we'll save it for next time. Yes. I could talk about the mental emotional part <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, but it's people love it too. There are plenty of people who love it. Um, all right. So I actually have a question beyond fertility for you around um yoga because you do everything like um pre prenatal. Uh, you do fertility, prenatal, postnatal, you, you do it all. And so I'm curious about that. Obviously it's all related, but I think here's, here's the mental health, emotional part of it and the spiritual part of it, which yoga is so like spiritually robust. Um, but folks, I don't, I don't know that they understand until um, they are, they've finally achieved a pregnancy, how actually, um, um, triggering it can be, uh, you know, each scan, each time you go to the doctor, each time you have your medical care, how 
hard it is. Um, and especially if you've experienced a loss as you have, Jen, that, you know, you're just on the edge of your seat. I'm sure you can speak a lot more to the intensity of it, but I'm wondering about that within the context of your work, how, how you support folks with that. I think that what we really get stuck on when we've been trying to conceive for a long time is I have to get pregnant. And once I get pregnant, I did it. I'm done. That's it. Well, well done. And that's just not the case. And when you've been on this journey for a long time and you've you've lost babies and you've lost embryos and you've lost relationships and it's affected your work and your sleep and every facet of your life, which we well know, that is so traumatic for your, your yourself and your body. And trauma isn't something that magically goes away. Trauma is, is held physically within your body. And you can think about talk therapy, you know, counseling and psychology and affirmations and mantras and all of all of these things are really great and they can help you intellectualize what you've been through. But if that trauma is still sitting in your body, it's still going to trigger you and it's going to come up at any moment. And when you're pregnant after how much, you know, loss and, and how much trauma you've already been through, being pregnant is, is not the easy thing that we think it, it's going to be after, you know, trying for so long. So what I find with my students is that they are, like you said, constantly anxious. They're waiting for every scan, like they can barely breathe. They get to all these milestones in their pregnancy that they think are going to be the thing. So when I get to my, my 12 week mark, or when I get to the NIP test, or when I get to the morphology scan at 20 weeks, all of these milestones are like, okay, I'll get to that and I'll feel better. And I was the same, but there was no milestone that made me feel completely confident in my pregnancy. There was still that lingering what if. And we all know that anything can happen at any stage of pregnancy, sadly. But what yoga in particular does is gives you tools to manage this. And whether or not it's a, a simple breathing practice, you know, something that you can do while you're waiting in the doctor's clinic or you're expecting a phone call with your beta results or something and you just feel in that horrible on edge state where you're you're in that fight or flight response and you just can't calm down. Yoga has tools to help you manage that, whether it's a breathing practice or a meditation practice or just moving your body. Sometimes meditation is movement and that's incredibly important. And when it comes to trauma, we hold a lot of trauma physically in our hips and especially as women, because that creative chakra down through, you know, the, the sacral area, which is where creation starts and begins. But it's such a, a deep and intense area that trauma kind of gets stored in, especially if we've been through things like loss and, you know, physical invasive, physically invasive procedures like DNCs and whatever the case may be. So yoga then offers us practices to release the this, this sort of stored trauma within the hips. So movements and mobility practices and uh, gentle trauma release exercises, which I think put all together with you know, the mind body stuff and the nervous system regulation, it really does give women some support tools to get through it. And we then think that you know once we have this baby in our arms, that's sort of the, the end goal, isn't it? But then we're faced with this whole new set of challenges as, as a new mother and a new parent, um, and no one can prepare you for that, no matter how much reading you do and how much you, you think you know. Uh, so there are so many ways that yoga can support you during this time as well. You know, when you have no moment to yourself during the day, but perhaps you can find one minute, two minutes to close your eyes take a few breaths, that, that might even be your yoga practice at the beginning of your, your new parenthood. So there are a lot of ways that it can support you. I hope that answers your question. I can ramble on about this stuff for a long time. <laughs> and this is, I'm just letting you talk because I love it. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. I think that also your voice is quite soothing. So 
<laughs> I do whenever I, I don't live in Australia I live overseas in Dubai these days and whenever someone finds out I'm Australian like oh you don't sound like a lot of Australians I think oh I can, I can put it on if you want me to <laughs> but I don't know I have a, I have a softer Australian accent than most I think <laughs> yes and the tone of your voice is quite conducive <laughs> to yoga and meditation I'd love oh, it thank you. yes that was very helpful um and Thank you for spelling it out that way, how the experience is actually the fertility experience, the trauma of infertility does not stop when you are pregnant and when you give birth, right? So even it's interesting, <clears throat> just a side note, my spouse, my husband, his trauma came after our son came home. Our son, we adopted, he was 18 months old. After he came home, that's when he started having these like realizations, oh, they have a toddler. I wonder how they had that baby. Did they have to go through what we had to go through? Did they adopt? Did they, right? So his trauma came up later. Meanwhile, I was completely peaceful because partly due to yoga and hugely due to meditation, but um, I'm like, wow, that's fascinating, you know, but it's a thing. It happens, right? So even folks who haven't, you know, women who have given birth and or adopted, et cetera, have a baby now, those questions come up. If you see a pregnant person, you're still wondering, did did they have to go through what I did? And conversations with people who are still parents are they're just qualitatively different. Right. So are they? They're so different. And even now my daughter is four and your kids are much older than mine. I do find occasionally I do still find myself slightly triggered by things and I I make assumptions about people I'll see a family with lots of kids that are close in age and I'll go well they didn't have any trouble falling pregnant right you know why why do these things keep coming up I have my family I have everything I've wanted but that's because that trauma is still there and it is it is a lifelong process being able to let it go and live with it and deal with it and something we all need to to work on yeah yeah to notice it in the first place, I think is a wonderful thing. And then to develop compassion around it for yourself. I think yoga is, is just an an incredible tool for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm so happy you're in the world, Jen. (laughs) Yeah. Can say the same for you, by the way, Dr. Maria. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Well, you and I are just amazing then, aren't we? (laughs) There we go. Can I just, can I just point out, I have to tell all of your listeners this. So when I was in the midst of, I think it was just after I had my miscarriage um, and I had been following you for a long time and your podcast was incredibly helpful for me when I was going through my journey. But you started doing spirit baby sessions around that time. And I was reading and listening to all of the the information you were giving out. It's like, this is some cool shit. I want in on this. So I did a session with you. And I'm very open to to things. You know, I I believe in in all sorts of stuff. Uh, But you described my son exactly you described his hair color, his eye color, and his personality in what you saw during that session. Oh, so cool. So, and, you know, and at the time I thought, okay, well, this is nice. It's kind of reassuring perhaps, you know, but I, I couldn't believe it. And I conceived him probably four months after I spoke to you for this, for this session and obviously couldn't see what he looked like or knew his personality until he was one, but it's real. So if anyone is <laughs> oh, thank you. thinking this is something they should do and to connect with their, their baby, oh, my goodness, please do it. Oh, thanks for that, Jen. Yeah, and he has fiery red hair, so it's like. He does. Obvious. You are not wrong. And that's not a, I'm not redhead. My, my husband isn't a redhead, so it's not like you were going, okay, she's blonde, he's blonde, you'll have a blonde kid. No, yeah. you. there was something there. <laughs> Where does the red hair come from? Is oh, actually, you? my husband's mom is a redhead and all of my mom's family are redheads. So oh, it's in there. Okay. All right. So genetically <laughs> there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jen. I'm so glad it was supportive though, right? That's the main purpose, right? I got asked on a podcast recently. Um, so, and they were, they're, um, they're, they're called the skeptic metaphysician. So they're skeptical, right? Which is great. They asked me, so don't you just like tell people what they want to hear? And I'm like, that's not the point. (laughs) The point is to tell people what's coming through, you know, that's it. And if it's not what they want to hear, then 
I have to say it, which is hard, but I'm so glad it was supportive for you and helpful. So it was amazing. You know, thanks for that. Well, mm-hmm. I am curious then what folks can expect when working with you. I was saying before that I looked at your website, you have a new program starting in January. So <clears throat> pardon me, but I'm wondering how that works. How does online yoga work? What can folks expect? So with fertility yoga, I find it's one of the practices that works especially well online as opposed to being in a studio. And the reason for that is because it's a very private journey for a lot of people. And I find that women don't necessarily want to go to a studio and have to explain themselves and go through everything. So it's such a nice way to be able to set up a really beautiful space in your house and make it comfortable and light some candles and do whatever you need to do to to feel like it's it's yours. And then we offer as part of the program, I have pre-recorded sessions that you can do at any stage that that you want to and different, different practices for different stages of your cycle, different length practices. So depending on how much time you have that day, you want to quick 15 minute practice, or perhaps you've got an hour to spend, you can kind of pick and choose as to what works for for your cycle. But on top of that, I do weekly live practices with with all of my beautiful women. So I I pick a time during the week and I actually have women from five different continents that, uh, that join me, which is pretty impressive. So it's a bit tricky to find a time that works for everyone. So we mix up the times and but it's just really lovely to be able to be in a in a space with women who get it and no one's asking stupid questions no one's giving anyone advice it's just you're all there and we're together so we do weekly live sessions and i have been really lucky as well to offer some special workshops and masterclasses with different fertility industry experts as well so we bring in nutritionists and uh you know eft practitioners and mindfulness coaches and all sorts of very cool people um, to come in and talk about what they do and how they can gain some additional tools to support their fertility journey. So yeah, I'm I'm really proud of it. And it's it's been it's been so rewarding, not just for, for me, of course, but just to pro- be able to provide a space for women where they can tune in on their own time if they don't feel like it that day. It's not essential. But uh, it's there if they need it. It's a support where they need it. And we've had some amazing success stories as well. You know, of course, I don't want to pretend that yoga is like a magic pill or a quick fix to someone's fertility problems. But I find that it can be, and it certainly was for me, like the final piece of your puzzle. You might have, you're taking great supplements and you know you're eating a really great diet and you know you're moving your body and you feel good and you're feeling positive but it's just not happening for a lot of women yoga can be that last little piece that just puts it all together and tips you over the edge and i have found that has been the case for a lot of women i've worked with so yeah yeah that's fantastic i'd love that you are also pulling in other resources right this is I mean, I think that that's really important, right? We all have our expertise, but being able to pull in somebody like you, for example, on my podcast, right? I don't know about yoga and right, it's like fantastic because the goal is to be helpful and to provide a, a whole package for folks to be able to move forward with ease and peace. And ah, is there a word for that? Ah. Yeah, <laughs> all, of this, all of that. And as much as we respect and appreciate and need medical doctors don't get me wrong Mm -hmm. they just they're trained to do what they do and they do it really well but they're not nutritionists they're not mindfulness coaches they don't know about all of the other things that can help your fertility and your 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 mental health on the journey as well so you know I, I don't find that many women can say their doctor has asked them what kind of support network do you have around you? What are you doing to release stress and anxiety? What you know, practices have you got in place on days that you're feeling overwhelmed? Doctors don't ask you those questions. And if you don't know that things are available, you don't know to ask for them either. So I'm lucky that I've been able to connect with some amazing 
women that are able to offer additional resources to, to what their doctors can tell them. It's so great. And you can go to Jen's website to see um, those, those folks um, that she's pulled into her, into her program, which is great. Well, all those will be linked at the sh- in the show notes, by the way. So um, I had two more questions. One, so the program that's starting in January, that's a group um, like online program is like via Zoom or how does that work? So it's a program I, I only launch it every three or four months because I don't want to work with a huge number of people at once. You know, I like to just kind of keep it small so that... Okay. You can, yeah, you really offer the support that you need to, to women as, the, as they're going through their journey. So when we open it again in January, uh, we will have access to when when people join up, they have access to all of the pre-recorded content, which, you know, there are dozens of different videos that they can go back through and practice at their leisure. But on top of that, they will then get access to all of the live classes that we do, the workshops. And if they want to work one-on-one as well, I offer that service too. If you live in Dubai, I'm very happy to to work with you in person, but uh, I don't actually have any any women within my circle uh, in my city. So, um, but like I said, I find that working one-on-one over Zoom is incredibly effective. So that's something that is possible as well. That's great. Well, that you must be intuitive because that was the next question. <laughs> you were one on as well. Like right? it. Great. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. So, Jim, where can folks find you? Let's just say verbally and then we'll link everything. Where can folks find you? So you can head over to my website, which is elementpilatesyoga.com, and you can have a look through all of my offerings and ask me any questions from there if you wish. Or you can find me over on Instagram and TikTok. I have TikTok these days, I know. And my handle is Yoga. And really happy to respond to DMs if you want to ask me anything individually. I also have a YouTube channel. So if you want to go over and just search Element Pilates Yoga on YouTube, I've got a lot of classes and breathwork practices and meditations that you can kind of dip your toe into to see if you like and see if you kind of vibe with my teaching. Ah, fantastic. You have a lot of free stuff that people can pick up from all those resources. Thank you so much, Jen. I really appreciate your expertise and you are lovely, a lovely human. (laughs) Everybody, (laughs) thank you, Maria. You are an incredible person. I'm very fortunate to have found you and to know you. So thank you. Thank you.